This is Jasmine, a senior environment artist with a killer portfolio. One night while digging for inspiration, I stumbled across this gorgeous diorama of an old library she created, and I couldn't get it out of my head. So I thought, what if I tried making something in that same spirit? After breaking down her approach and soaking in every detail, I fired up Blender and got to work. In this video, I'll take you through some of the key steps I followed to bring my own version of this scene to life, from modeling and lighting to texturing and final tweaks. If you're interested, I've uploaded all of the project files from this scene to my Gumroad page. Feel free to download them, explore the setup, and see how everything comes together behind the scenes. All right, let's dive into the first step. I wanted to break down her modeling workflow, and luckily for me, she posted tons of images showcasing her method. All of her assets were sculpted in high detail and then baked down onto low poly versions. Even the foliage. She sculpted individual leaves, baked them into base color and normal maps, and used those to build foliage clusters. Such a smart and efficient approach. I also picked up on a few other clever details, but I'll walk you through those as I build my own models so you can see them in action. I won't cover every single modeling step. Instead, I'll focus on the most useful tips and techniques I used to keep this video punchy and packed with info. For example, um, here's how I made the crown piece on top of the bookshelf. I wasn't exactly sure how to approach it at first, so I just ran with the first idea that came to mind. I started with a simple plane, deleted the top edge, and scaled it to fit the frame of the shelf. Then I right-clicked and used the subdivide tool. I picked an odd number of cuts to make sure there was a vertex dead center on the edge. I'll need that in a moment. Using proportional editing with the root falloff, I pulled that center vertex upward to form this nice rounded arch. I'm not sure how Jasmine did hers, but for me this method was quick, simple, and got the job done. I scaled the arch to match the interior width of the shelf and extruded it along the x-axis. Then I selected the vertex sitting right on top of the shelf and made it the active vertex. By changing the transform pivot to active element, I was able to scale the whole arch on the z-axis while keeping that point locked in place. And just like that, I had a solid base for the crown detail, ready to be shaped and refined. To create the curved piece, I used Blender's Spin Tool. Just select the edges you want to spin, click the plus icon in the tool panel, and drag to start spinning. At first, it's going to look like a hot mess, but don't worry, we can clean that up. In the tool properties, I switched the axis to Y, since that's the direction I needed it to rotate. Then, I adjusted the center point by sliding it along the X and Y axes until everything lined up nicely. Finally, I tweaked the angle and reduced the number of steps to simplify the geometry. After that, it was just a matter of manually modeling the rest into shape. One thing I noticed about Jasmine's models is their slightly irregular silhouettes. Every piece has these subtle curves, almost like the wood has soaked up years of damp air, really selling that old, worn-down feel. At first, I started pushing things around manually, but then I remembered there's a smarter way. I added more geometry to the mesh to give myself room to work, and then brought in a lattice modifier. I assigned the shelf as the target and cranked up the lattice resolution. Since it's just a deformation cage, we don't have to worry about performance. From there, I used proportional editing to gently nudge and warp the shape, giving it that perfect, lived-in imperfection. Once I finished modeling the base shelf, I duplicated the mesh one copy for the low poly and the other for sculpting a high poly version. To get more control during sculpting, I separated each part of the shelf into individual pieces. You can do this easily in edit mode by pressing P and selecting Buy Loose Parts. Then I added a remesh modifier to every piece and set the voxel size to something small, 0.1 centimeters in my case, which gives a really nice density for sculpting. You can go denser if needed or even switch to Dintapo if you prefer more dynamic control. Just make sure your mesh is watertight. Remesh doesn't play nice with non-manifold geometry. Once the remesh was applied, I jumped into sculpt mode. I used the clay strips brush to carve in the wood grain, draw sharp for cracks and crevices, and scrape to chip away those edges and give the wood some character. I followed the same modeling approach for all the other assets in this scene. 
Since there isn't much more to cover on that front, let's jump into texturing. For every asset here, I used a single base material, a smart material I custom built for stylized models. It's packed with all the essential layers to quickly give your assets that handcrafted, painterly vibe. And hey, if you want to try it out yourself, you can grab it for free from my Gumroad page. Now, I've already covered detailed texturing workflows in previous videos, so in this one, I'll just show you a few quick tricks to get clean. Simple results in no time. Let's start with the clock. I found this awesome image over on Pixabay, an amazing site where you can download high-quality images for free as long as you credit the original creator. So huge thanks to T-Farm for making this beautiful vector graphic. It was the perfect starting point for my clock asset. I imported the image into Photoshop and quickly removed the clock hands. Then I added a simple background color just so I wouldn't have to deal with transparent parts later in Painter. Now on Jasmine's clock, I noticed that the numbers looked slightly elevated. And I really liked that effect. But instead of sculpting them by hand, I went for a faster solution. A height map. Height maps are black and white images that tell your shader where to create the illusion of height. Super handy. While you can create one in Photoshop, I've got a better tip for you. I used a free program called Materialize. Links in the description. Just load up your color texture, hit generate under height map, and boom. You're done. You can tweak the settings to your liking, but overall it's way faster and more intuitive than trying to nail it by hand in Photoshop. I imported the textures into Painter and got started. First, I added a fill layer and dropped the color texture into the base color input. Now I could use the projection tool to stamp it where I want, but I prefer this method because it gives me more control. Once the texture was in place, I added a black mask to the layer and simply painted out the parts I didn't need. Next, I plugged the height map into the height channel of the same layer. To fine tune the effect, I just switched the channel mode to height and adjusted the intensity until it felt right. Oh yeah, don't forget to invert your height map, as this map has incorrect values for the bumps we need. I've got one more quick tip for you. I wanted to create the land formations on the globe as fast as possible, and painting them by hand? Not my thing. So instead, I used a procedural mask. I added a fill layer to a black mask and dropped in the 3D ridged noise fractal as the generator. Crank up the contrast, tweak the scale a bit, and boom, instant continents on your map. To create the foliage, I have to admit, I cheated a bit. I modeled and sculpted the thorny stems myself, but when it came to the grass, I got lazy. Jasmine, on the other hand, did an incredible job. She sculpted every leaf and flower, baked them onto a plane to generate normal maps, and combined them with base color textures to create really polished foliage clusters. Super cool workflow, but I was at the point where I just wanted to speed things up. Luckily, there are tons of free models online, and Sketchfab is a great place to look. You might need to dig a little to find something that matches your style, but you can always tweak them to fit your scene. Just remember, Sketchfab's policy requires you to credit the original authors. I've linked the models I used in the description. I tweaked the models a bit, mostly adjusted the colors, and then populated my scene to match the vibe of Jasmine's version. Just enough to keep that same cozy, magical atmosphere while giving it my own touch. For the final touches, I didn't need to do much. I brought the image into Photoshop, tweaked the levels a bit, and added the camera raw filter using the warm contrast preset. That alone gave it a nice lift. I also used one of my favorite brushes to draw in some god rays, just to enhance the ones already rendered out in Blender. And that's pretty much it. Now, I know I left out a lot, like how I made the gothic window or how I handled the light hitting the floor through it, but don't worry. There are tons of little tips and details I could go into, but sometimes it's best to just explore things on your own. That's why I'm giving away all the project files for this illustration completely free. Just follow the link in the description and grab them from my Gumroad page. Open up the files, dig around, and learn at your own pace. If you'd like to see the entire process without any cuts, I'll upload the full time lapse to YouTube as part of the membership program as soon as I'm eligible. So if you're into that, feel free to show some support by subscribing to the channel and let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.